Now, these are voices that have encouraged us. And we want those voices to be better known among the Anglo churches. Oh, that's amazing. It's because sometimes people, they don't understand that our church became our family for real. That in most areas, the American church is in decline. But immigrant churches are growing. Refugee churches are growing. Immigrant churches are growing faster than Anglo churches. Mm -hmm. They're like you, Beto and Millie. They believe they're called here to be missionaries here. Mm. And I say as an Anglo Christian, welcome. We need your help because we're, we're failing to reach our culture. Welcome, my friends. This is Christian Podcast Live, broadcasting from Costa Mesa, California, to all the world. So we're so excited you guys are here today, and today I'm with my wife again. It's becoming the commonality that my wife is on the English stream of the show. As many of you guys know, we're doing this in two languages. We're doing Christian Podcast in English, and we're doing... El Christian Podcast en Español, in which I talk with my wife every week and we discuss topics. But in today's topic, I mean, this is going to be a great conversation because we're going to be talking about how the American church needs Latino help. And what better way than having my wife, who's an amazing Latina, and she's a great leader in our community and here in the United States, to voice out really like what is going on with the church in America. But before we do that, I just want to say real quick, this show is sponsored by Christian Podcast. That is right. We're sponsoring ourselves. We're so excited because Christian Podcast is growing. We're becoming the number one platform when you Google Christian Podcast. And our goal is to start creating content that adds value, that challenges people to have faith and encouraging All right, so that's the goal, that's the purpose of Christian Podcast. The best way in which you can partner with us is visit christianpodcast.com and support our show. Subscribe to the shows, share it, and even get some of our amazing merch that you can shop on our shop. So just visit christianpodcast.com. So there you have it. So with no further ado, I want to introduce firstly, Millie. How are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Beto, for having me. It's a <laughs> pleasure to be here. I love to do life with you. Love it. Okay, Millie. So why don't you introduce us to our guest today, Eric Costanzo. Of course, Eric, welcome to our show today. It's an honor to talk to you and, you know, share life with us. Uh, it's, you know, Beto, he wrote this amazing book with another um, two guys. That's correct? Yes. And it's, I just love the name of the book. Can you pronounce this? Inalienable. Sounds like Inalienable. the aliens are coming. The aliens. <laughs> It sounds like the aliens are coming. <laughs> the aliens were here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's true. I mean, this is an amazing book. So, Eric, I mean, yes, you are part of the writers of this book. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? I mean, just tell us a little bit of who you are and why you wrote this book and why three authors. Thank you, Beto and Millie, for having me. I'm already having fun. Nice. Um, That's the goal. This, First goal. This, this <laughs> is, I love the energy. Um, and thank you for mentioning the word aliens because uh, we, we did have a child who saw their parent reading this book and asked what if the book was about aliens mm. and uh, like space aliens. So we thought that was pretty funny. But um, yes, I, I'm very honored to be one of the three co-authors on Inalienable, How Marginalized Kingdom Voices Can Help Save the American Church. And we do talk a lot about the Latino church in, in the book. And uh, we worked on this project together because honestly, Uh, it was bigger than one person. Mm -hmm. And I think that what what you'll certainly see when you read the book is that it's bigger than three people. We really felt like we needed to widen as much as possible the, the number of voices that would have input into this project. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it was something that started with me 
a few years ago, and I realized in the process I, I needed some help to to bring this to fruition. So I'm very honored to have Matthew Sorens and Daniel Yang also as a part of this project with me. Love it. Okay, thank you, Eric. So let's start right here. Out of the five emojis, you know we like to have fun on this show. And we think emojis help because emojis are all over the internet. And we're on the internet right now. So out of the five emojis, which one would you pick? And what would be the idea that you would categorize it under? Um, what would be that idea? I really wrestled with this. But I, I chose skeptical. Skeptical so, emoji, all right. Why is that? Yeah, skeptical emoji. Uh, because... I think that from the very outset of the book, we ask questions like, is there still hope left for the American church, specifically the white American church? Mm. And then we ask questions like, can the American church be saved with hopeful answers? And so, so it, there's a bit of skepticism just in, inherent in the, the ideas that we're wrestling with. But the overall tone of the book is hopeful. All right. I love that. So for that, the reaction on today's episode is the skeptical emoji. That's the Kickstarter of today's conversation. So good. All right, Mili, why don't you why don't you ask the first question today? I mean, when you hear all of that, Mili, that the American church, I mean, things like, is it worth saving the the white people in America? Like when you hear all of those, what what stirs up in your heart, Mili, as a Latina, as a person mm. from Mexico, as a person of faith? Well, Uh, when we show up in this country, oh, my first church here in this country was like a Latin community, right? For some reason, I was feeling like, Beto, this is, doesn't feel right. I just, I've been here in this church for five years and, and I'm not learning English. Every, everything I was doing was in Spanish. You know, everybody around me was in Spanish, but I'm here in the U.S. and I feel if I don't have, I'm not close with the uh, Anglo people, I'm never going to learn, right? And so we moved to a different church where the, with the Anglo church and was a bless, was huge at that time. And for some reason, God brought us to a small church with, we speak, you know, like uh, Anglo church, but While on that transition, I saw that the Anglo churches were like little and little and little. I mean, shrinking, like, like another level. You know, I saw churches split, like where where I where, where I was, right? And right now, where we are, the same. You know, we are such a small church, but in the same building, we are we have a Latin church, and it's growing. Huge, it's coming big, <laughs> you know. Like, uh, and and uh, and I'm so proud, and I'm so happy about it. Like, and somebody actually uh, asked me, like, Millie, why? Uh, don't don't offend, but why do this church always bring food or they celebrate together? Like after church, they have parties. You know, they bring food because it was Father's Day. If it's Mother's Day, like whatever it is, there's always But a party going it's on. Always, <laughs> and, and I like, oh no, you do, you you don't offend me. That's who we are. It's because sometimes people they don't understand that our church became our family for reals. Because really, when we come to this country, we have no one. We don't have friends. We don't have grandma. We don't have aunts. We don't have family around us. So where we go is that that's your family, right? So sometimes they celebrate grandpas here at the church. With this grandpa, that's everything they have. You know, the, the members of the church became their family. So my question in this point is like, uh, I love, I, I sometimes I feel like, Uh, we are like an aliens here, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I always try to raise my voice, but at some point I feel like nobody, nobody listens to me or my voice doesn't matter, right? So my question here is like, uh, where is your experience or where, where were you when you discovered this? I wonder. Mm -hmm. I, I think your experience, Millie, several of the experiences you shared are very common to things we heard or observed when we put this, the information together for this book. Mm. 
we heard from lots of immigrant Christians that in the United States who felt led to go visit a more Anglo church, and they were surprised that the churches were small and that they were much older. Hmm. And in fact, we quote one person in the book uh, who says, we thought maybe the young people were in a different part of the building. And then we realized that they weren't there at all. Mm. It was just a much older population. And, and so that, that's been the experience of a lot of immigrant Christians who wanted to, in, they wanted to have their worship experiences integrated with white Anglo churches, but they found it hard to do that unless they went to a really large church. And in the really large church, they oftentimes didn't feel like they had that community that they're used to, where the church feels like a family, where they share meals. One immigrant Christian told us, you know, the, the parking lots in the American churches, they empty so fast. Mm. And in our churches, mm. we stay after church and we spend time together and we share meals. And so uh, a lot of other immigrant Christians shared those same feelings. And I think that what you would find from myself and Matthew Sorens, my other one of my other co-authors, is we have spent a lot of time in the last several years with the refugee and immigrant communities. Mm. And in doing so, we've met a lot of Christians who've come from global places in the global south and and have had this these experiences as you have. And we've also observed that immigrant churches are growing faster than Anglo churches. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the reasons I chose skeptical is because we point out in the introduction that in most areas, the American church is in decline, but immigrant churches are growing. Refugee churches are growing. In my city here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we now have 14 uh, Burmese churches, mm-hmm. Christian churches from Burma, and uh, they've been growing amazingly. And it's it's um, so we've seen that. And, and I think that uh, those have been our experiences. Daniel his family came, my other co-author came to the United States as a refugee family, mm-hmm. and they actually weren't believers when they first came, but they came to know Christ, got involved in a church. And so Daniel has had first person experience his whole life with Hmong churches, immigrant churches from the Hmong community. And so I think that what, what helped us write from that perspective together is that we've all had more experience with immigrant churches than probably most Anglo Christians in the United States. Mm. Daniel, though, is an insider. You know, he's now Matt and his wife attend a Latino church in Chicago, even though they're Anglo, they attend a Latino church. But Daniel has had that experience his whole life. So I think that that all together drove us to say we want other people to learn and experience the beauty of what's happening in the immigrant church like mm. we've been able to experience. You know, I feel like we are not so organized like you guys. You know, <laughs> the Anglo church is like super organized, super clean. Like they have a beautiful program. They follow the line. They follow the hours. As a, as a Latino, we show up late. <laughs> you know, we're not organized. We're not that clean. But it's party. It's 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 love where you go, and I feel like sometimes the Anglo communities, they have enough family, they have enough friends, they have a busy life, and it's hard for them to have an open door to welcome more people who is different than than there. You know, like just uh, in on on my own experience, sometimes. Uh, it's hard to talk to people because if I don't pronounce correct the words I'm saying, they they, they don't want to have a conversation with me because it's hard for them. You know, like <laughs> and, and I feel sorry for me and for them because I know we all can learn from each other. Yeah, what do you think of that, Eric? I mean, you were talking to so many people around. Uh, I guess from all over the spectrum. So this is, like you said, this is not like a new story to you. So when you hear this, how is the, you know, like going back to that title, like how, how is the Latino church going to help in America? Like what, what, the, what needs to change? We have strengths in each of our churches mm. that the others do not. It's kind of like in our marriage relationships, you know, each of us brings strengths and weaknesses into the the covenant. So we can we can help each other in the process. And and I think that the, I'm I'm thankful that there's a 
more of an emphasis now on multi-ethnic churches and worship spaces, but we also don't want to see the Latino church as it's an individual uh, kind of worship disappear. And I think that there's there's a lot to be gained. And, and one of the things we bring out in this book, uh, we really try to elevate as many global Christian voices as possible. I, we, we want to stop, we want American Christians to stop treating our Latino brothers and sisters and others as little brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Even, even if maybe um, our, our, some of our churches have been around longer. We, we don't want to treat others. It's not beneficial for us to treat others just like little brothers and sisters, but to say that we all have strengths and we have the same Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and we're much stronger together when we have real evil forces out there working against the church, mm. why wouldn't we work together more and not work against each other mm. in the process? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so good. So the global church, I mean, I love how you're voicing out the global church and, and that perspective. So basically what you're saying is maybe because the Anglo church or the Western church has um, maybe – some sort of power, right? Maybe economical power and resources. I mean, to have that and to consider the rest of the church as little brothers. I mean, even that, it's almost like we have all the resources, therefore we're almost like in a higher position. And it's so interesting how even in the book you said, now there's more Christians in the global South, like outside of America and the Western world. There's more Christians than there are Christians in America. And even I was reading that the number one language spoken by Christian now is Spanish, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, that is epic. So, uh, how can we empower? So, we talk to a lot of people. We're Latinos and we have the Spanish stream where we're talking to people uh, from Latin America, really, and you know, here in the U.S. who are Latinos and you know, are pursuing faith or church. How can we help our Latino brothers see ourselves as we're not the little brothers anymore, mm. right? Um, and yeah, what do you have to say to that? You know, like empowering the Latino church to say, hey, you have something very special. Mm. I think it comes back to some of the things that you all shared in describing your experiences. Yes, by and large, Anglo churches have more resources and because we have our churches usually are older churches and we've been in this culture longer, we can sometimes serve as more of a gatekeeper. You know, if, if I were going to plant a church in Honduras, for example, you know, I as an as an American planting a church in Honduras, I would need to learn who are some of the key people in this community that I need to know who have the resources, who have the connections, who can help me understand the laws, who can help me understand you know, avoid some of the mistakes that a person who's not from that culture would make. And so in some ways that there's, there's still a need for Anglo churches, American, more American born churches to just help facilitate opportunities. But when we do that, I think we can get out of the way. You know, the, the goal is kind of like when you're teaching a child to ride a bicycle, mm. it's the parent doesn't hold on to the seat of the bicycle forever. Mm. They help that child be able to get to a place where they can pedal and they let them go. In my own church, you know, we're, we're mostly Anglo, though we do have some wonderful immigrant and refugee members. We are a larger church in our state. We're very organized. I laughed when you said that, Millie, like we're so <laughs> structured that if we go two minutes past our normal time, people get really uncomfortable. Mm. They're, they're like, you know, I've got, I've got another appointment. I've got to go to, you know, if people show up late, they miss because we don't like, we start on time. We, we can benefit fatigue in worship and in study and in, in fellowship without being tied to a schedule and, uh, and doing life together more regularly. And in many cases with the immigrant churches that I've been a part of, I've seen that glad and sincere hearts, kind of like you said, it's a party, Mm. Uh, but they're growing in the word together and growing in their Mm. faith together. So I think maybe we could teach each other some strengths about organization and some strengths about not always having to have organization, but having freedom. Mm. It's almost like when, when you're an immigrant, right, and you're here in this country, 
you need to look for ways. I mean, I think it's the struggle, right, mm. of being in the U.S. that kind of like not forces you, but really invites you to have faith on a daily basis. And maybe that's where, when, when you think of the church in America, right, if you think of maybe a church, like the American church, maybe it got a little bit of entitled, right? Okay, we, we got all the things pretty good. No, so maybe I don't even pray and things go pretty well, mm. right? And for an immigrant, it's like, man, I got to be on my knees daily, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not saying this is, no, like, to it's ask just for like a, a generalization, <laughs> right? Um, so in that sense, I mean, uh, Eric, how are you seeing the, you, you're talking about like, you no, know, even the friends, your co-authors are going to these churches, that are Latino and the, the, the face of America in a sense is changing. Um, I think when I came to America, I think of myself almost like as a missionary. So what is your, your maybe what makes you excited about what the future looks like for the church in general and for the church in America? Well, I believe that Christ promised the church will endure until he returns. I love our immigrant churches. So there's, I think, a mistake that a lot of Anglo-American Christians make. They say, oh, isn't it great that the Lord is bringing all of these people to us from the nation so we can reach them? Mm. Now, I would rather them say that than say, we don't want people from the nations to come to us. But mm. the reality is so many people coming from the nations are already reached. They're like you, Beto and Millie. They believe they're called here to be missionaries here. Mm. And I say, as an Anglo-Christian, welcome. We need your help because we're, we're failing to reach our culture. And I remember I visited a church not far from you all. It was in Tijuana, Mexico. Mm. Uh, just, and, and I visited them on, uh, for, for quite a while. They're on the other side of San Diego. And they had banners hanging up in their sanctuary that said, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the city of Tijuana. And then they had Judea, they had Jalisco as Judea. And then <laughs> for Samaria was the Estados Unidos. Their, wow. their Samaria was California, Baja California. And I said, here's this, this uh, immigrant church that's struggling in Tijuana because they have so many migrants who are there trying to serve and mm. find a place for them to sleep. But they're still saying, How can God use our church to reach the United States with the gospel? Mm -hmm. And so we are thankful that our Latino churches are here to be a part <clears throat> of God's missionary force. And as one of our immigrants says in the book, um, he says, you know, if, you're, if your Anglo churches are not ready to let us lead from your pulpits, we will still continue to serve in our neighborhoods, mm. in our job, and in our schools. Mm. And I love that because uh, if our Anglo churches don't continue to make the mistake to not engage more with Latino churches and other immigrant churches, our Latino Christians and immigrant Christians are still going to serve in their communities. Oh, They're still going to represent yes. Christ where they are and make their communities better. And so this book, I, I would love for this book to get into the hands of, of more immigrant Christians and more Latino Christians to hear, to see their voices represented and to see, you know, an Anglo Christian like myself and Matt saying that um, these are voices that have encouraged us. And we want those voices to be better known among the Anglo churches. Oh, that's amazing. I just want to cry. It's, you know, what you're saying, I, I feel in it. And, and I just want to say, thank you for what you're doing. And, And the same to my pastor, you know, Pastor Mike Decker, he will live in us. And that's thanks to him, we are here. And, and that makes me like super happy, super happy because yes, we live by day, we live daily, but thanks to their support, I know they're praying for us. They love us. They know who we are and what is our background. And I feel their support. And thanks to them, I feel like I have a voice, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, that's how we feel the love of God. It's not just Him and the His Holy Spirit. No, 
is around the people who is around me, right? I feel their love. I feel that when we don't, when we have a need, they're there to pray for us. And I feel like I have such an special cover around me. And I believe what God says I am because of them, because they're, 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 they're I'm on their eyes. You know what I mean? Like, like the same way I always, for example, go to my kids' school and most of the people, they're Anglo, but it's a bunch of nannies, right? And they're Latinas. I go to them and I hug them to, because sometimes in this culture, people see these uh, women and they see them as a nannies and they not even say, hi or good morning or look at their eyes right it's a little bit of discrimination but not because they're mean they're pretty nice moms and pretty nice dads pretty nice people but they're 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 they're, i always explain to people like you know the horses when the horses have (laughs) things here on the side so they don't look around who is around me and i always try when i go to that kind of places where there's a lot of mix you know, Latino, like who are nannies and moms and dads or grandmas, I always try to go and hug them to all of them. You know, like I I don't care if if, uh, you're a nanny and we are the same because I always think that at the end of the day, we are humans and we have exactly the same needs. We want to be seen. We want to be loved. And uh, I just, you, when, when I feel like I'm not loved, when I feel like nobody cares who I am or what I have to give, I just think on Jesus and I raise my hands and I, God, you are everything I need. Just cover me, fill me with your love because right now I feel like, you know, people turn and they give me their back and, but it's okay, it's okay. I just need you, I just need you. you know, yeah, I need to be strong because better people is coming, better opportunities are coming, and we are here, honestly, to give love. We have so much love to give, and and I think that's my purpose in, lo- in life, to love people around me. I'm so thankful. I can tell that you <laughs> have that kind of love in your heart, and, you know, you your community involvement experience is not unique, but it will get better and you're getting, you'll, you'll get more competent to speak up. And I think that's part of the thing we really try to make sure we make, make clear in the book is that everyone has a voice. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't speak for someone who can speak for themselves, mm-hmm. but sometimes what we can do is stand beside someone, stand behind them if they need it. And maybe even stand in front sometimes to if, if they're getting attacked and say, Hey, you know, this person is under my protection, but we want to amplify every voice. And we want those voices that have so much to bring to the American church to be able to have the opportunity to speak and to be read. And I know that uh, just a, a short example that's similar to what you described. Um, and, and yes, people have their blinders on. We all have our blind spots. We get in bad habits sometimes in the way we we talk or don't talk to people. But my wife and I have a small nonprofit that is here in, in Tulsa, and it works with immigrant and refugee women and, and teaches them how to sew and do tailoring. And it just, we've, we've been exist, in existence for about five years doing this. And uh, we just came to the realization that everybody on our board is Anglo. And, and yet the vast majority of people we work with are from different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. And so we've just added in the last couple of years, we added our first Burmese board member. And then this year we'll add two other immigrant board members who are actually voting members of the board. They are part of the authority of our small organization. And uh, what a blessing. I mean, that, it's not fair to the immigrant refugee community for us to only do things for them and not let them have a voice in the decision-making process. And so I think we can do that in our churches and hopefully it will be more of your experience in your community in schools and things like that, where you're involved, because you obviously both of you have a lot of gifts to bring and a lot 
of, of things that skills that God is developing in you mm. and you want to use them for the kingdom. So you mm. need to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm, I feel it. like God brought us here for a purpose. He's always working. Always, you know, every, every second of my life, it's a challenge. Every day is a challenge. And I think, Oh God, what is, you know, whatever it is, it is coming. It's something huge. Because you brought me from so for for far away, right, to a place where I remember the first days you were going to a restaurant, and I just like feel so weird. Like everybody's talking, blah, 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 blah. You, what <laughs> is this? Because I understand zero. I was speaking zero English, and I never went to school. Okay, all my broken English. For is, English, you mean? Because you I went, mean, you have a master's yeah, in marketing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I have. Um, I studied in Mexico, but when I moved here, you know, it was a challenge. And but I feel like now I have the the opportunity to talk. I know it's hard for people to listen to me, but I'm here, and I just want to say thank you to my husband too, because thanks to him that he believes in me, give me that power, like, oh, yeah, that's true, I can be with you next to you, just to be next to him, or like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm on that level, probably not, but I'm going to get there one day, and... Yeah, and we're, we're like the new guys of the TVN show, remember? I forgot, the Crouch, I think it was, whatever they were. <laughs> that was always the husband and the wife sitting together. Anyways. Yeah. What's your? Uh, let's do go to the last question, Millie, uh, that you have for him, and then I'll I'll do my kind of like wrap up of the episode. To be conscious of his time because they never go over time. Yes. At his church, <laughs> and we're about to, so <laughs> we don't know what uh, that's gonna be how like. About, how about if we listen from you a story? What I just love it when I was reading the book that uh, about the I don't know if you I think you was saying that story that everybody was on a boat. And they Remember? start drilling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you share with that that story? Sure, because sure. it's beautiful and and uh, that's how I feel. Right, Beto? We can end up with that story because we all are in the same boat. Mm. This is this comes from pages five and six early in the book. And it's in a section called The Sinking Ship, mm. where we talk about the fact that most Anglo churches are in decline, and there's there are a lot of concerns about problems and and even idols that are in in the American church. And so we quote a story from an old Jewish rabbi. This story is well over a thousand years old. It's about fifteen hundred years old, and uh, the story is really short and simple. Men were on a ship. One of them took a drill and started drilling underneath him. The other said to him, what are you sitting and doing? He replied, what do you care? Is this not underneath my area only that I'm drilling? And they said to him, but the water will rise and flood us all on this ship. And we say the ship that is American Christianity is filling up with water mm. in many cases as a result of holes that we've drilled ourselves. Mm. The wounds which continue to weaken our effectiveness are self-inflicted and yet all too visible. The solution we believe is to return to the inalienable truths revealed to us in scripture. And we also say, we want to stop drilling holes. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to start patching the holes. If we get attacked, if the ship gets attacked from the outside, that's different. But if we're inside the boat drilling the holes and flooding it for everyone else, then we have to solve that problem first. Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay, so this is what we're going to do, Eric. Uh, we kind of know the, the worst idea in this is, you know, kind of where the church is going and not do anything, uh, living with apathy and without hope. But let's go directly to the most divine idea. Like when you think of, of the voices that you were listening to when you wrote this book, uh, when you think of the kingdom of God that you write about a lot in the book too. What would be the most divine idea that you can think of when it comes to the church in America and the inalienable, um, 
Yeah, the inalienable, I don't know if the word is rights, but that we have as inheritance of the kingdom of God, followers of Christ. I think the most divine thought is the kingdom of God is all around us all the time. Hmm. There's nowhere we go that we have to bring the kingdom with us. The kingdom is already there. And what we need to do, whether we're an Anglo church, a Latino church, a multi-ethnic church, a church in America, or a church in another part of the world, we need to discover where the kingdom is at work, announce that the kingdom of Christ is present, and then be part of his kingdom work. And there are things that we can certainly say from scripture are part of the kingdom, things that are holy, things that that drive us to love God more and love our neighbor. Hmm. And then there are things that are not of the kingdom, things that divide, things that are hateful, things that are selfish. And so when we want those things to go away, that's mm. drilling more holes. Mm. And we want this, those beautiful, holy aspects of the kingdom to be more present in our churches and in our lives. And so that's the, the, the thought is to bring those inalienable things of the kingdom out so that we can recognize them. So good, Eric and Millie, thank you so much. This was a super helpful episode. I think, I mean, it inspires me. All the emojis, I mean, I feel like I felt all the emojis throughout this episode. And I'm inspired. I'm inspired by hearing how God is at work, how His kingdom is moving. And we need to pay attention, right? Mm. The kingdom is already at work. We just need to show up and see where it's at work. And maybe raise our hands and say, I want to participate, right? And I think... I think God wants us to participate and He wants to open doors even for those voices that sometimes we feel marginalized, we feel unheard. You know, have a little more faith, reach out and ask God and I think He will open doors. Right? Eric, thank you so much for being on the show. Would you point people to where you want to point them to, you know, to get to know you more or your book or find your resources? Thank you. What a joy to be on the show with you. I feel like I could do all of those emojis as I read the book. <laughs> um, we, I'm on. I'm. You can find me on social media, Eric Costanzo. This book, Inalienable, is available from Amazon. It's also available from InterVarsity Press, and really anywhere books are sold, you can find it online. So, um, I, I, if I do social media, it's mostly on Twitter. So you can find me there at Eric underscore Costanzo. But I'm not hard to find on the internet. And anytime you see the work we're doing in our immigrant refugee community, and if you come visit us, we'll treat you like a king and a queen. Sweet. I feel like mm -hmm. I wish we would have recorded this like two weeks ago since I was in your town. Mm -hmm. And I would have wanted to see you all and have a meal with yeah. you. But hopefully we'll, our paths will cross in person someday. Yes, let's do it. I mean, whenever you're here, let us know and we'll hang out for sure. Thank you so much, Eric. All right, my friends. Well, you guys know it. This has been such a good episode. And we just want to say all the show notes are going to be available at christianpodcast.com. That is the best place that you can show your support to this show and to what we're doing. Visit christianpodcast.com and then, you know, get shop on our emoji merch, shop our mugs, coffee mugs. I love drinking coffee. Millie and me, we Salud. So good. Salud, Millie. And share and subscribe. Like this episode. Rate us with a positive review everywhere you're listening or watching. Thank you so much, my friends. I'll see you guys. And you'll listen to us on the next one. All right. Ciao.